there is no skilled labor out there left at the dealerships to be able to fix your modern complex vehicle. And there is no one coming in to take their place. 18 years and counting spent in the automotive industry. Successful shop. This is why I left the dealership and almost changed careers completely. So a little background about myself. I have about 16 working years of experience in the automotive industry. And uh, let's go through some of my experiences. I started in technical school when I was 15 years old. So two years of technical school, we had this program at my high school where you did high school for half the day and then you went off at a separate campus for technical school. So two year technical school certificate in automotive technology. Right after high school, three years of an apprenticeship at a Mercedes-Benz dealer. After Mercedes-Benz, I worked at an independent repair shop and doing smog checks for a short period. Um, after that, four years at two different Subaru dealerships. So where I have the most experience and where my most intensive time of working and training was at the two different Subaru dealers. First big turn in my career, right after the dealership, five years as a government employee working on fleet vehicles. So fleet vehicles, meaning law enforcement vehicles, parks, school buses, garbage trucks, wheelchair equipment, all the above. Second big turn in my automotive career. Five years at CM Auto House. Crazy, I know. Before I, I go any further, I really appreciate all the support from you guys, especially my, my paying local customers because literally you guys have paid to support me. So sincerely appreciate it from all you guys, but especially my local customers. Literally without you guys, I could not afford to do what I'm doing right now, which is to live my dream and also support our community at the same time. I've been doing this a very long time now, almost two decades. So again, from my working automotive career, you heard there are two big turns I took. I'm leaving the dealership and going to work for the government and then finally I'm leaving the government position and starting my own shop. Two big turns in my career where I basically said to myself, I'm done. This industry sucks. The pay sucks. The working conditions suck. I'm, I'm done. I'm over it. So part of the story we're missing between leaving the dealership and going to work for the government, both times pretty much I was like, I'm done working on cars. I'm sick of this. I need an out. I want to change careers. And so I'd say during my last six months of working at the dealership, probably six months or more, I went back to school. I had an AS already. I already got the units I needed to transfer to a four-year university. And so during my last six months working at the dealership, I went back to university. I worked in the daytime and then took night classes in order to pursue my bachelor's in behavioral science. Again, I'm, I'm sick of cars. I'm done with this. I want to do something else. At the time, while I was going to school, there was a lot of people around me who advocated for a public servant job. So working for a government entity as a long-term, more stable way in your automotive career, right? You have a benefits package, you have a good retirement, pension, all the above if you become a government employee. So, you know, with all these merits, I was like, okay, I guess this is the way I should go. So a year of tests and interviews, I ended up getting in as a government employee working, you know, as an automotive technician working on the government fleet. I believe it was the last two years working for the government that I had never been so miserable in my life. I specifically remember that period in my life. I don't think I have smoked as many cigarettes as I have during that two year period. Um, it was so bad. I was so miserable. And once again, I was at that point where like, this is the same nonsense as the dealership. I'm, I'm done with this. I'm done with cars. I'm, I don't want to do this anymore. Last two years, I went this time opposite. I'd go to school in the daytime. I'd take personal time off to attend class. So like I'd strategically, you know, take one day off per week for this, you know, whole semester just so I could take that Tuesday, Thursday morning class or whatever have you. And yet I finished my bachelor's in behavioral science during my time working with the government. The job I was going for was called counselor one at Juvenile Hall. You don't just interview for this job. I had to take a public test and basically beat out everyone, which I did. So let's say out of, I don't know, let's call it 200, 300, 400 applicants. I beat out majority of the applicants 
you know, taking this written test. After the written test, then you get a phone interview and then you go to the final interview. And basically the part I got to was I passed the phone interview and they were trying to schedule me for the in-person interview. And I think I was figuring out my school schedule at San Jose State for the next semester. So I, I basically said like, I need to think about the in-person interview, right? Because if I got to take this job working the days, that means like I, I can't finish, you know, completely finish out my bachelor's. What ended up happening, they really wanted me. So I kept on getting calls back. Like, please, we there's still a spot open. Can you do this? Can you do the in-person interview for group counselor one for juvenile hall? Here's the second twist. And then I got the offer from Grant from Battle Garage to open up my first legit industrial space and run the auto house legit and so you guys kind of know the story from there here i am so yeah this close to leaving the automotive field completely this close and again working for the government there was a lot of the same problems i saw that were that were the same as when i worked at the dealership so what are the issues? What's wrong with the dealership and why would it be so bad that would make me want to completely leave the automotive industry? Service advisor pay discrepancy. There is a huge gap with how much a service advisor gets paid versus how a technician gets paid. I know it's two different jobs and it may not be as fair to compare, but the amount of education and experience and training that a automotive technician has to complete and do for himself daily and we'll get into that after this you know such an educated and experienced person in my day was making a fraction of the wage of what a service advisor makes and in my experience a service advisor is just a glorified salesperson same as used car salesman unfortunately this always didn't used to be the case way back in the day you had to be a journeyman or shop foreman level technician to gain the role to be a service advisor basically you had to gain the knowledge and experience to let's just say know what you're selling fast forward to modern times i'd say especially in the 2000s it's a 180. to be a service advisor you just need to know how to sell a product and or service you do not need to know anything about cars a case in point at the last dealer i worked at there was one guy who used to be a comcast salesman had no idea about cars but to his credit, he was a very good salesman. Service advisors don't need training. You are a salesman. One thing I can compare this to, I heard a dealer car salesman say to another one time that the more you know about cars, the worse car salesman you are going to be. Take from that what you may. Remember that service advisor from Comcast? Probably the most unprofessional person I have worked with in the automotive field. Uneducated, probably just had a high school education, but uh, excellent salesman. Again, technician and service advisor, we're comparing apples to oranges, but just from my perspective, you know, all the active training, experience, certifications, professionalism that I had to put in or that was demanded of me to put in, my wages did not match. Someone who didn't have to educate themselves, could come in dressed sloppy, would come into the shop, play practical jokes like it was no big deal. Considering this is a hazardous environment, right? Dangerous things happen, people can get hurt and yet you're out there playing practical jokes. But he could sell product and service very well, which made him untouchable. I personally don't agree with that. Respect your trade, be a professional. Technician training. <sighs> I had to take a sigh for that one. Peers in my field, we used to be called mechanics. Why is that an outdated term? One way to put it, there is very little mechanical that we are repairing on cars now. And here's what I mean. We have cars that can park themselves, that can drive themselves, that can stop themselves. Everything on the car is automatic. If something on that car is not acting like it should, or it doesn't work anymore at all, who is the one who fixes it? Not the engineer who designed it. It's me, the technician or mechanic that you call a uneducated, dirty grease monkey. I'm the one who's fixing all the holistic multitude of complex systems in your modern automobile. And so unfortunately, tomorrow's gonna be the start of 2024. And here we are in 2024, there is still this extreme stigma that we are just 
you know, quite frankly, dirty and uneducated and shouldn't be paid that much. Here is just some of my training. ASE Master Certification. So I have been ASE Master Certified for probably more than 10 years now. Still active to this day. What is an ASE certification? Again, really simple. It is a certification that says you understand the basic principles of these automotive systems, right? So there's an ASC test, for example, for steering and suspension, brakes, electrical, air conditioning, engine repair. To be ASC master certified, you need to pass eight tests. Each of these tests gets you certified and they need to be renewed every five years. What does that mean? Is that I am studying and taking tests all the time. We're gonna get some comments below about how ASC tests don't mean anything. I agree. They are not the best measurement of how proficient a technician is, but unfortunately in our field, it is the only measurement. California smog license. <clears throat> it is a lot easier to get your smog license now. They separated out the license types so that you could, it used to be the strongest smog license you could get was called the enhanced area license. And that means you could work at a test and repair station. What do you need to do to get your California smog license? Or at least back in my day, the big bad enhanced area license. Get three ASC certifications and arguably the most difficult ones. Engine performance, electrical, and then the hardest ASC period. L1, Advanced Engine Performance Specialist. I personally had to take that test three times in order to pass L1 and be L1 certified. So three ASEs and we're not done yet. California Clean Air Car Course. So California Clean Air Car Course, I believe it was two nights a week for a semester. So six months, two nights a week, eight hours a class. You had to take this course called the California Clean Air Car Course. We're not done yet. Three ASEs, Clean Air Car Course. And then finally you can take the test to get your California smog license. Keep in mind at the time of taking that test, I believe it had a 70% failure rate and we're not done yet. Once you pass the California smog license test that has a 70% failure rate, we're not done. You must renew your license every two years. What does that include? So 16 hour update course. So every two years there is an update course. I would do the Saturday, Sunday course. So eight hours on Saturday, eight hours on Sunday. So every two years, I'd probably have to take time off because I used to work a Saturday schedule and spend 16 hours to renew my smog license. So you guys keeping score? Eight ASCs I need to renew every five years. California smog license I need to renew every two years. Factory training. Typically, whatever manufacturer you work for, they have their own training. So, you know, if you go to the Honda or Subaru portal, they will have their own training for sales, technicians, service advisor. Sometimes the trainings would overlap. I know one year it was a requirement that we did some online service advisor training, which again, keep in mind, I don't think service advisors even need to do the service advisor training, nor do technician training, but we're, we have to learn their job. Daily training. As a technician, you should be learning daily. What are some ways I had to learn every day? Uh, researching technical service bulletins. There'd be new TSBs every day, um, new recalls. Sometimes these TSBs or recalls would get updated so that there's a new repair or a new part that you do for the same symptom as before, the old TSB is outdated. So you constantly had to stay up to date on what was the most up to date repair for, you know, this recall or TSB or specific issue with this vehicle. Working for Subaru, there was also the tech tip newsletters. I believe it was a monthly newsletter that would have tips and basically like updated like service bulletins for technicians. Um, but still important because, you know, if you did not read your tech tips newsletter, you might run into something and, you know, be like, I've never run into this before. What am I supposed to do with this? Or what is this extra part in the valve body? Does this go in the car or not? You know, there may be that tech tip newsletter might have like, oh, um, the part it gets shipped with is superseded. Do not use this part for this repair anymore. Um, so yeah, important. You read through all the tech tips newsletters daily. This was all my active training. This doesn't include the two year AS degree in automotive technology that I probably spent three years getting because, you know, I've always had to work and go to school at the same time. And this also doesn't include the previous two years of a trade school when I was in high school. All of this that I just mentioned is the active training that a technician has to do throughout the entire career. Your training and education never stops as an automotive technician. Tools. 
Every automotive technician is actively buying tools. We're using tools for eight hours a day. Stuff will break. New cars come out. There are updated tools that make our jobs easier or faster. New technologies and new parts come out that require new tools. The dealership does not provide any of this to us. This all comes out of my pocket or out of the technician's own pocket. There's no reimbursement for buying tools that you need. There is no reimbursement for buying tools that the dealership needs. Sometimes as a dealer tech, you're expected to buy tools that the entire dealership needs. Here's one example. I used to keep my jumper pack on a bicycle chain lock. The entire dealership would need jumper packs all the time. You could never find them, so I bought one myself, which means everyone wanted to borrow it. So keep in mind, this jumper pack that I spent $300 of my own money on has now become a resource for the entire dealership. If that jumper pack breaks, no one's reimbursing me for it. I'm buying another $300 jumper box out of my own pocket. Dealers often don't have the right special tools. Every single dealer I've worked at, we don't have the right special tools that are vehicle or manufacturer specific that you need most all the time. And sometimes, unfortunately, the special tools, whether by accident or maliciously, technicians will hide or steal them or lose them. I'll give you an example. Crank pulley tool. I need this tool to hold the crank pulley to break the crank pulley bolt loose. Very, very common. Everyone needs it all the time. Very expensive tool. This tool would get locked in people's toolboxes all the time. When someone would get fired or quit, sometimes they'd steal the tool and take it with them. I still need to do my job. What does that mean? I am not going to waste my time going around the dealership, seeing who has the tools, where the tool might be. What ends up happening as a tech is that you buy that special tool for yourself. Keep in mind that special tool might be a thousand, two thousand dollars, and you may only need it once in a while, but when you need it, you really need it. You cannot do the job without the special tool, even if that special tool is $2,000 and the dealership's supposed to provide it for everyone. Again, this is all overhead that a dealer technician has to deal with himself and pay out of pocket. And it is not a concern for the dealership. If you don't have the tool to do the job, that's your problem. I remember at the Benz dealership I worked at, they were replacing a soft top and there was this Mercedes-Benz special tool that was kind of like a zipper tool to basically put the soft top together. And I remember our service manager saying, I am not going to spend $300 on this tool that we may only use once in the history of this dealer. I can see where he's coming from, but keep in mind, now the technician working on that convertible top has to either, well, not either, he has to on either his own time or his own dime, figure out a way to do this job that requires this special tool that you should not be doing without the special tool because you might get hurt, something might get damaged, all the above. If you don't have the tool, it's your problem. Later on, we'll get into the issues of why that's also a problem if a tech is getting paid flat rate without a base pay. Technicians need to do almost every job in the service department. Let's go down the list. Scheduling, typically there's someone in the front office that schedules when some a customer calls in and asks like, when can I bring in my car, what time, what day? The technician actually needs to fill the scheduler's job sometimes. Let me just give you an example. Say we diagnose a car, it needs this repair and we're waiting on parts so the customer has to bring the car back. I need to Basically, I need to be the schedule now, go to the service advisor or the scheduler and say, hey, can Mr. Lee bring the car back on this day at this time in the morning? And I want him to bring it early in the morning so that I can get the job done for him in time because he has this appointment to make. All of a sudden, I am doing the scheduler's job. Service advisor. Remember I was saying service advisors don't have to know anything about cars? So if they need to explain something about what's wrong with the car, can you describe the symptoms? When does this happen? Guess who has to come out to the front and talk to the customer now and do the service advisor's job? Technician, it's in my job title, automotive technician. Parts department, typically how a tech orders parts on whatever portal the dealership's using. I'll type in a description of the part, right? Like OCV bottom left side. And the it is the parts guy's job to look up the correct part number, verify with the technician. Maybe there might be like an O-ring and a spacer that the OCV needs. It is, ideally it would be the parts guy's job to say like, hey, do you need these two parts along with that OCV? That doesn't happen. What ends up happening, because I don't want to lose productivity time, 
the tech will take it upon himself to look through the electronics parts diagram and find the correct part numbers, find the related parts, type it out and type out all that information to the parts guy. So again, doing the, all of a sudden I'm not the tech, I am also doing the parts guy's job as well. The cough drop. Oh man. <coughs> we can keep this in for some comedic relief. I'm gonna eat this cough drop. My mouth is really dry. This is a long script. Warranty clerk. If your car is under warranty and it's getting repaired, here's how that works. So there is a book time for every warranty repair. So let's say, make it easy. The it needs brake pads under warranty. So the technician will get paid, you know, let's just say half an hour to replace the brake pads on this car under warranty. So it's the warranties clerk's job, once the tech and the service advisor is done with the RO or the repair order, to go through the repair order and make sure that the job is billed for that half an hour so that the dealership can get paid from the manufacturer for that half an hour. Here's the problem with that. At one Subaru dealership I worked at, it seemed like we would go through a warranty clerk every three months. Sometimes the receptionist would be the warranty clerk. Why is this a problem? They don't know about cars. So let's just give an example. I do a job where I'm replacing camshafts under warranty. So the warranty clerk looks up in the warranty code, replace camshafts, three hours. Cool, simple. We're gonna build three hours for this job. The dealership's gonna make three hours from the manufacturer and the technician only gets paid three hours. Do you recognize any problems with this? When you re replace camshafts in a car, what else are you doing? Maybe you're draining and refilling the AC, draining and refilling the coolant, draining and refilling the engine oil. You're taking under trays off. Maybe you have to take the wheels off to do this job. Maybe you have to take the hood off to do this job. After you've replaced the camshafts, you should probably do a valve adjustment on this job. On and on and on. So it is actually the warranty clerk's job to look up all the warranty codes, know that, oh, this camshaft job there are all these other things we actually need to bill for so that the dealership gets paid the correct amount and the technician gets paid the correct amount. Especially at one dealer I worked at, this never happened. So in order to make sure that I was getting paid the correct amount for this warranty job that I'm only making half my wage on, and we'll talk about that later, and I'm gonna repeat that one more time. This warranty job that I am only making half my wage on. I would take it upon myself to, and it's been a long time, but basically look at the portal that the warranty clerk uses and there'd be like a three digit code for a labor item on a car. So for example, like WBJ would be remove engine under trays. And so I would look through the warranty codes and write them out on my repair order to make sure that I got paid the correct amount for this job. I guess I'm the warranty clerk now. Janitor. It is the technician's job to keep his own stall clean. Fair. It is not really the technician's job to keep the entire dealership clean. What do, we, what do I mean by that? Other areas of the dealer, if the bathrooms have an issue, if the oil room has an issue, if maybe like the spare parts room, any of these areas in the service department where the technician needs to reliably access in order to do his job, if it's dirty and unorganized, even if it may not be the technician's fault, right? Like let's say an outside contractor fixes the plumbing and leaves the tool room a mess. Now I can't find any of the special tools. Guess who's cleaning that up? Manager. A lot of times the technician has to be the service manager for the service department. Yeah, unfortunately, I think every dealer I worked at the, especially the, you know, I was second lead at one of the Subaru dealers I worked at. I pretty sure every shop foreman at every dealer I worked at didn't really make that much more for the extra managerial duties he had. And even if you're a regular tech, you still had some managerial duties, right? So managing how other techs are doing. If there's salespeople that need something or shouldn't be in the shop, all of a sudden the tech has to be the manager and deal with the salespeople, the finance department, the scheduler. If there's like some interpersonal issues, a lot of times in the shop, it's the technicians taking care of it between themselves or the shop foreman, or maybe, you know, the older guy in the shop acting as the manager to solve things internally. Dispatcher. Dispatcher is the guy that hands the technician a work order. It takes time, it takes planning, right? You don't want to give a complicated work order for this Nissan Skyline to um, Cowboy Thomas, who you know isn't very good and can only change oil 
and is gonna get the car dirty and mess up this expensive customer car. The dispatcher has to know that. For example, John, I know is really good with these older vehicles and that's his specialty. I'm gonna try to make sure that he gets, you know, these older vehicles so that um, he's happy and then also that these cars can get the most accurate repair. At dealers I've worked at, different people have been the dispatcher. Sometimes it's a free for all. Sometimes the service manager dispatches. Sometimes the technicians have to dispatch for themselves. Either way, all of a sudden, I'm not just having to do my job as a technician, I'm also now the dispatcher. Yeah, also part of janitor. Majority of dealerships I work at kind of don't care about the service department. They really care about the front public face of the building, so basically the sales department. But if the service department has issues, right, like mechanical issues, um, the public doesn't see, so who cares? Why put money into it? And um, I'll just give you some examples. So one dealership I worked at, the building was very old. The, the lifts would have issues. I actually have a permanent back injury from that dealership because basically the lift, the hydraulics failed and it came down on my back. Airlines would pop open all the time. I remember specifically around that era, Chris Brown had a song, No Air. And I specifically remember that because the uh, shop air compressor would break all the time. And I'd play that song on YouTube just because this was such a joke. Are you guys serious? If the techs cannot work because there's no air, the dealership is literally losing money. I, I could not comprehend that. But what I'm getting at is that if equipment's broken and the technicians cannot work and the dealership doesn't want to fix it, who ends up fixing those issues with the dealership or the building? So I'm going to take my own time to fix this issue, right? This major issue with the whole dealership, like the compressor being broken. I may even take my own money. I remember one time going to Harbor Freight to get universal O-rings to fix something with the dealership. And a random customer behind me was like, you have to buy your own O-rings? What kind of nonsense dealership do you work at? <laughs> And it's funny, even the even like a regular guy from the public knew that, you know, spending your own money like that to fix a uh, a building problem was nonsense. Technicians are the least respected in the dealership. It's 2024 pretty soon. We are still seen as dirty, uneducated grease monkeys. I halfway jokingly tell people that even the receptionist gets way more respect than, you know, the senior master technician in the shop. That guy is again to 99% of the public still just a dirty, uneducated grease monkey, unfortunately. I have written in my notes, stereotypes suggest technicians are uneducated, low ranking in the public and dirty and replaceable. I don't know if this is just an American thing. I know in other countries where they value skilled labor, it's not like this. In fact, in, I believe, and someone can correct me if I'm wrong in the comments, that if you're a skilled tradesperson in Japan, you can be seen as a sex symbol at times. Totally not like that here in America. Pay. The pay sucks as an automotive technician. Before we talk about the flat rate system, let's go over some history. So back in the day, it used to be, and again, someone can correct my facts. I believe it used to be a 50-50 split. So for example, if the shop rate was $150 an hour, that means the technician got 50% of that. So the tech would get paid $75 an hour. It is way less than that now. And I'll tell you specifically locally, an entry level technician at a dealership in the Bay Area makes about $33 an hour flat rate starting. Our local dealership rate is around $200 to $250 an hour just for like a regular dealership, not a Range Rover, not Mercedes Benz, just like Honda, Toyota, $200 to $250 per hour at our local Bay Area dealerships. So yeah, you can see the split is nowhere close to 50-50. And where's all this money going? It's the dealership overhead. So, you know, to put it in short, that $250 an hour does not go anywhere close to the technician. What you're paying for is like other people's payroll, the lights, the electricity, the rent in the dealership. And it's really important to recognize that because unfortunately, I have historically been a very nice guy, which means when there is a very irate customer, they would send me out there. Again, not my job, right? Service advisor's job. They would send me out there to try to quell the upset, unruly, unreasonable customer. And a lot of times I'd be called a crook or a thief because they believed that $200 an hour went straight into my pocket. When in fact, under the flat rate system for me to go out and talk to you, try to diagnose a repair for you and road test with you, I get a grand total of zero dollars an hour for my time to help you out under the flat rate system. Test, 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 cough drop in my mouth. 
why don't we talk about what is the flat rate system that automotive technicians get paid by? So as of now, there is this pay scale where technicians have to make a base pay. There was actually a lawsuit after the 2008 recession in LA. Basically the group, I believe it was a group of technicians from a Mercedes Benz dealer banded together and had a class action lawsuit that technicians perform roles in the dealership that they still need to get paid for. It is not just billable work. So for example, there's work in the dealership technicians do that go beyond just fixing cars. And we've outlined a lot of the roles that tech has to fulfill um, earlier. And so they won the lawsuit and basically what happened in California is that technicians cannot, literally cannot be allowed to make zero dollars a day. Um, I worked under this era. There are plenty of days where I worked a 10 hour day and made one hour. So how much was I getting paid? I think I was making like $22 at the time. So I worked an eight hour day and made $22. Making, legally made $22 working an eight hour day. You know, in a skilled trade where I have spent my life training and educating myself for actively. How does this happen? So under the flat rate system, you are paid by flagged time. So what does flag time mean? Let's say I get dispatched a repair order for this Nissan Skyline. Front brake pads and rotors on this Nissan Skyline. And that job has a flagged book time of one hour. And we'll go into some scenarios about how that one hour could go right here. And majority of the time it does not work the good way. And here's an example. I get this car, it has wheel lock key. Can't find the wheel lock key. So now here's where I burn time. I look in the car, can't find it. Talk to the service advisor. Hey, does the customer have the wheel lock key? I can't find it in the car. Of course, I get talk back from him, right? Like, what do you mean you can't find it? Are you stupid? Did you look in the glove box? Did you look in the trunk? And here, here I am already burning time, um, getting disrespected by someone in the shop, or I should say the service advisor. And I have to explain, no, I looked through the car and I can't find it. Now he's got to call the customer. Hopefully the customer will tell us, yeah, it's in this secret cubby, right? And then, yeah, now I can finally take the wheels off and do what I was supposed to do in the first place, right? Do the brakes. All this time, if you can imagine, half an hour may have elapsed. I am doing my job, but I do not get paid for that half an hour. Again, commission with no base pay. Let's give another example. The rotor is seized onto the hub because it's rusty, right? So I do the right thing. I spray PB blaster, I heat up the rotor, I use a puller that's going to properly separate the rotor from the hub without damaging the wheel bearing or anything else. And I may have burned an hour because the rotor was rusted onto the hub. Who pays for that hour? And realistically, the customer should pay, right? Like, hey, I need, I need extra labor time because there was this unforeseen issue with the car that already existed. In reality, what happens is you eat the time. And usually a tech doesn't want to go to the service advisor because the service advisor will say like, hey, your coworker wouldn't have asked me this. He would have just taken off the rotor or, or like, no, it, it wasn't that hard to take off. You're just being selfish and asking for more time. Or, you know, another excuse is like, I can't call the customer for that. They're going to completely decline. And they're never going to come back. So I ate an hour. So now, you know, let's just say I only had to fight one of the rotors. A job that only pays book time one hour. I have spent two hours on this job. What does that mean? So I have worked two hours, but I only get paid my one hour hourly wage. Long story short, as a dealer technician, you almost always lose under the flat rate system. Pretty much you can play flat rate two ways. Uh, you can be as efficient as possible in order to get as much flagged you know, book time as possible, or the unfortunately more common way, be dumb and dishonest. How do you be dumb and dishonest? Here's a way to be dumb and win in the flat rate world as a tech. We would have cars under warranty with a Bluetooth concern all the time. 99% of the time it's because the customer doesn't want to read the owner's manual and figure out how the Bluetooth works in their vehicle. Basically how to pair the phone and uh, play songs, whatever. Instead, they bring it to the dealership and say something's wrong. If I get this work order, I already know that the customer doesn't know how to use this Bluetooth. I verify that you know my phone pairs and can play music and can make calls. I've literally now wasted about 
half an hour total. Go grab the vehicle from the parking lot, bring it into my stall, hook up my phone, verify everything, write my story in the computer, tell the service advisor, drop the car off at car wash. You can see a half an hour could obviously elapse. I remember back in the day, I got paid zero dollars an hour to verify because under a lot of manufacturers, you do not get paid diagnostic time. All you get paid is the repair time. So if I diagnosed that there was no concern, how do I get paid? I don't. And so what would usually happen? How do you play dumb to get out of doing these sort of concerns? Here's a few ways. I worked with an old man who would be like, Bluetooth, my tooth is blue. And he would pretty much play dumb to get out of any of these like new technology concerns. Like once you heard that from him, you'd be like, man, I'm, I'm not giving it to Mike. Yeah, Mike's obviously not the one for this. But he got out of basically losing half an hour of pay. I mean, under the flat rate system, he could actually be getting a break job and you know, in that half an hour making an extra, you know, he be, could be making even more money beyond that half an hour instead of this uh, Bluetooth concern that would, that he would accurately spend his time diagnosing, but get paid zero dollars an hour for. Dishonesty, more rampant than you would think. Um, I have not been at the dealer in a long time, but I can only imagine it's getting worse. Again, under the flat rate system, you are paid by how fast you do a job, not how well you do it. No incentive to do quality work. Rushing out a job and cutting corners is rewarded. And I'll just give you a a minor example. So I used to work with a tech who, I know on one year of Subaru Legacy, it was kind of annoying to take out this cabin filter. It'd be under the dash. You'd have to crawl under there. There'd be these like 12 annoying clips to take out and put back in to put the cabin filter in. It was an annoyance, but it, you'd be like, oh, whatever, this is the, the uh, legacy that like sucks to put the filter in. How do you save time on that? When you get the cabin filter from the parts department, you throw it in the garbage. Yeah, no joke, it happens all the time. Throttle body cleanings. I remember my first day at one dealership, one of the techs was like, you see how I do a throttle body cleaning? He took the, the throttle body cleaner and he put it in his toolbox. And that's exactly how you perform a throttle body cleaning. And unfortunately, this is what happens under the flat rate system. The faster you do a job, the more you get paid. And then if you can flag more hours, like let's say you make a lot of hours per week, you are rewarded from management, right? Because, you know, look, Working an eight hour a week, Mike can flag 100 hours of labor time. Ezekiel, how come you can only flag 76 when you've worked 80 hours? I don't know, man, maybe because Mike's throwing away cabin filters instead of putting them in and has a stash of brake clean and throttle body cleaner in his toolbox when I'm actually doing the job. <clears throat> yeah, you know, you spend the extra time, you know, working with customers, doing the job correctly. Let me get this a little bit cleaner. Let me verify my repair road test after I do a repair, um, wash off the car for the customer, make sure the car is clean. I don't get paid for any of that stuff. So under the flat rate system, why should I do it? And so as you can see, you know, under that paid scale, unfortunately you are rewarded for playing dumb, being dishonest. And then the third one that's not written in my script is being a kiss ass. There are work orders that are simple work, but pay very well. What are some examples? For example, brakes is a relatively straightforward job. I can do front brake pads and rotors in less than the hour I'm given. There's some other jobs like major services like 30, 60, 90 K, which is typically good money for a technician, especially if you're being dishonest, right? You're throwing all the fluids in your toolbox or in the trash can. So if I am a kiss ass and I kiss ass, to whoever dispatches the work, or you know, I say like, hey, I'm Ricardo, I, I heard you like it. I heard you like to eat steak, right? Let me buy you a steak for lunch and let me buy you a steak for lunch every single week. You know what I'm saying? Dude, it happens. It happens more often than you think. Something unspoken that unfortunately, hard for me to talk about, but definitely like a race issue at the dealer, right? Like if your group of coworkers are a bunch of good old boys, they're a bunch of Asian people, unfortunately, you kind of look out for your own. And you know, if you see all the Asian people in the shop getting the uh, gravy work, right? So the gravy work being the work that is simple, but pays well. That's kind of how things go in a lot of dealerships. Flat rate and warranty work. Why don't I give an example of how warranty work gets paid right here? J02 valve spring recall is a perfect example. We're gonna boil it down. There was a recall to replace valve springs if you had like an Impreza or, you know, most notably a uh, FRS or BRZ. And there were so many examples of your engine blew up 
after the recall was performed. Again, flat rate system, let's go back. Here, the JO2 valve spring recall, the engine had to come out of the car and apart. It's a big job. If the engine's gotta come out of the car, it's a big job. So the engine's gotta come out of the car, come apart, cleaned up, replace valve springs. You gotta clean everything perfectly and then reseal it, put the engine back in, you know, add all the fluids, bleed everything, road test it, functions check, I'll make sure everything's okay. And I'm getting paid half my wage for all of this. So if you guys can imagine, that's exactly why a lot of these engines failed. Why am I gonna look through the instructions to see how to do this recall correctly? Why am I gonna, why am I gonna go the extra step and go beyond the recall, remove the oil pan and see if there's any excess RTV from when I cleaned up or, you know, the, this engine has a hundred thousand miles on it. And this is what happened to a lot of these JO2 cars, maybe old RTV or old stuff from the car having it a hundred thousand miles would block the oil strainer and starve the engine of oil. Nobody's paying me to go the extra step to make sure that this job is done correctly or that this engine will last for the customer. No one's paying me to go the extra step. And as a matter of fact, I'm getting paid half my wage to do this recall anyway. And so that's exactly what we saw. Whether it was the technician's fault that foreign stuffs were blocking the oil strainer and starving the engine of oil, excess RTV when the engine was sealed back together and that causing problems, basically not following the outline procedure of how much and where you should be applying RTV. I've seen a lot of these XJ02 cars in person and yeah all of them majority of them are terrible it's like I hate to say it but it's like a little kid using a hot glue gun and being like right with the RTV another technical note OEM RTV needs 24 hours of cure time to seal properly what that means uh, room temperature vulcanizing right so basically at room temperature the RTV which technically comes out as a liquid it'll harden to be kind of like a semi-solid right so it needs to completely harden in order to be able to resist deflection right if the engine's flexing and most importantly to resist fluid leakage right so coolant oil dealer techs cannot wait for rtv to cure due to flat rate system yeah all the time you know i do i remember being at the dealer we do like warranty oil pan or transmission pan reseals dude the customer's waiting in the lobby i need to get this car done in an hour plus i'm getting paid uh, half my rate so this warranty trans pan reseal plus refilling the trans plus you may have to use the scan tool afterwards i'm only getting paid half my wage so half an hour to do all this work, drain the ATF, drop the pan, clean both surfaces of RTV, reseal it, fill the pan, go back into the scan tool. There may be like a reflash or you, you may have to do some like programming for the trans. I'm only getting paid half an hour for all of this. So who cares? They're like, yeah, I'm only getting paid for half an hour for this, come on. And um, I'll just give you another example of a uh, warranty work that either did not pay for me because there was no, rep there was diagnosis, but no repair or the warranty clerk could not or did not know how to find the correct warranty items to bill for it. Brake squeak noise all the time. New cars, customers would bring the car in under warranty. My brakes make noise. Again, flat rate system rewards for speed, not accuracy or level of completeness for a job. Probably the right way for this repair if the car legitimately made a brake squeak noise was to take the brakes apart, take the pads out, lubricate the pads, lubricate the slide pins, make sure the, the rotor doesn't have any defects on it. By the time you're done with this, an, at least 1.3 hours may have elapsed. And if the warranty clerk did their job, you may only make like half an hour on this because the car is under warranty. Again, you know, a lot of manufacturers claim they pay diagnosis and repair together. So if there is a diagnosis without a repair, right? Technically nothing, nothing got done on the car, even though we actually did something, I got paid $0 for that work order. I got zero dollars to either fix the car or verify that this is either a normal condition or nothing's wrong with the car. So let me let me give you a real world example of brake squeak noise because it was notorious during my time working as a flat rate dealer tech. So what is the, you know, there'd be an inside joke with a dealer tech like just flat rated or shotgun it. What is the flat rate brake squeak noise repair? Different for multiple techs, but a few ways to do it, just douse all the calipers in either WD-40 and brake clean and then do a really hard 
brake bed in. At that point, the brakes would probably stop making noise for the time being, just enough so that the customer could pick up their car. And who cares if the brakes made noise again, because then there was, it was like a probability game, right? Like hopefully this brake squeak work order will go to somebody else. I can just get this out of my stall and actually do a real job that will pay me at least some money instead of no money. Another issue with the flat rate system, customer pay time versus warranty time. So really simple, if the car is under warranty, the technician will get paid a predetermined warranty time. Again, oil strainer cleaning. If a customer is paying out of pocket, they're going to get billed the book time. Let's just say three hours. If the car is still under warranty and there is a recall, right? So let's just, for example, Toyota has a factory recall for excess RTV in the strainer. And the recall repair is for you to drop the oil pan and clean the strainer. For this recall, the technician will get paid half of his wage. Why does this happen? I don't know why this happens, but you know, I, I watched a video about the flat rate system and it's one thing he mentioned was that it's really messed up that if there is a factory defect with the car, almost everyone wins except for the technician. And then, and then last thing that really hits home for me, at the end of the day, you are not a team. Every tech is a contract worker competing against each other for work and thus pay. You are not a team in the service department. We are all individual contract workers as a technician. We are not even Subaru, right? We are just a contract worker working for a Subaru dealership. What does this mean? If my stallmate is financially not doing well because he's known as a diagnostic guy and he gets the difficult jobs that don't pay well, that actually is great for me because that means all the easy jobs that pay well can all come to me, which is super unfortunate, right? Because unfortunately, that means you are trying to see all your peers do bad. Because unfortunately, if they're doing well, if they're getting a lot of work orders that are easy and pay well, that means you're doing bad. It's not an equal playing field. There's only a finite amount of these basically good jobs, just like real contract work. There's only a finite amount and we all have, and we all have to f literally fight each other to get these good jobs, even if it's like a sneaky, dishonest way. <sighs> Again, happens all the time. The service department is not a team. The pay I get or the success a dealership gets, I worked for a dealer. It was the highest volume sales dealer in, I believe, the West Coast or the country. You think I, as the tech, got any benefit from that? Still, I still got shit on by you know the salespeople, the service department. It didn't matter. The success of the dealership as a whole did not translate to my success. And why that hits home for me is because the biggest thing I miss about working at the dealership was actually the camaraderie between my fellow technicians. Every dealer I worked at, there was at least some level of camaraderie, whereas like, we all know we're suffering here, we all know the flat rate system sucks, we all know that one tech is a dishonest bad guy, is a nice way to put it. So like, we're gonna band together and help each other out, you know? I, I'll just give you an example. You know, I made a mistake on this customer engine one time, which means I had to take the timing cover back off, which is a huge job, right? And so my fellow technician brothers, at least one of them, he saw it, he was like, damn it, man. So he took it upon himself to take the front cover out to basically the detail bay and uh, clean the, off the front cover for me. Yeah, it's like that kind of like those relationships and camaraderie as a dealer technician that I really miss. And that person I am still great friends with today. So I mean, shout out to you, Mike. So to sum it up, the root cause of me leaving the dealership and almost completely leaving the automotive field is the flat rate system. And you know, not only the flat rate system, but basically the trickle down effect that working under the flat rate system as a dealer technician caused. Uh, what about the government, right? Yeah, unfortunately, not every government entity is like this. We had a pretty zealous manager during the night shift and he would count hours and I would be reprimanded for hours. And again, it'd be like, work faster, work faster, work faster. And I'd be like, this is ridiculous. Like I'm trying my best and this is not the dealership. This is ridiculous. Like, let me get paid my regular wage and repair the car as best as I possibly can within my ability. Like, don't talk down to me like this. Don't, don't rush me like this. I've <clears throat> been doing this for almost two decades. Like, I, I don't get it. Like, give me a little more respect and credit.
And that leads me to my last point, the technician shortage. If you know that it is hard to find a good technician, forget even someone who knows what they're doing. Let's get someone reliable. Can you show up to work on time? come dressed, don't do drugs, at least on the premises. Don't get drunk during your lunch hour. I've seen all of this, by the way. Let me at least get a reliable person in here. Forget experience. Let me at least get a reliable person in here for the technician role. Extremely difficult nowadays, almost impossible. And you guys probably know about the technician shortage. I mean, one key, key thing to look at, it has always been difficult to find a, you know, good shop, right? Even worse, if you have any sort of specialty vehicle, and let's just give some examples. If you have any like specialty Mitsubishi, AE86, something imported like a Cresta, Skyline, Chaser, impossible, impossible in 2024. Next to impossible, I should say. We are short on technicians. Technicians of my experience have basically given up on the field and basically all gone to work a desk job at somewhere like any of the EV companies, Tesla, Lusa, you name it. Remember, I almost changed careers and became a group counselor. Some have gone into other trades like plumbing, electricians. Yeah, it, this industry sucks to work in. It's hard physically, of course, mentally, emotionally. The pay sucks. Why should I do this anymore, right? And that's exactly why the experienced techs have all left to go do something else. The youth today do not want to be technicians. Again, you need a lot of training. The pay isn't good. It's hard work. Why am I going to do this? I can go be a contract worker for this tech company and basically double what you make. And I can sit and play on my phone all day. I, I don't understand why be, why work on cars? All this accompanied by all the reasons I just listed, the flat rate system, fulfilling the entire dealership's job duties. Why, why be a technician in 2024? And so here's what's happening. Fast forward to modern day. And I'll start out with this uh, personal anecdote. I went to go uh, visit one of the old dealers I worked at. One of my old coworkers still works there. It was a Saturday. They're basically doing a personal project. They're doing a, a manual transmission swap into their uh, Japanese market vehicle and they needed some advice on the clutch setup. So I was like, cool, you know, I'll go visit this guy again, see what my, you know, see what my old dealership looks like. And so one interesting thing I learned while I was there is that because of the technician shortage, the car washers are actually the first ones in line to start as a technician. Now think about that. Their current junior techs basically all have no experience. They're learning as they go they can't get people to come in off the street and want to be a technician. So the next in line to fix your vehicle, that guy used to wash cars. That's kind of the state of the industry now. I remember a lot of, basically the bar keeps getting lower and lower. I remember my time applying to multiple dealerships, trying to get my entry level job. And I remember the minimum requirements were like AS degree, at least two years of experience, this many ASEs. Yeah, it's not like that anymore. This, this era was like 2008. Flash forward, it's 2024, almost 20 years. The bar is super low. I almost want to say, if you can come to work on time and have a driver's license, you can work on cars too. <laughs> and so that's where we're at, 2024. Why I left the dealership and almost changed careers completely. I think universally, as uh, technicians, we don't know what the solution is as far as the technician shortage, as far as something to replace the flat rate system. We don't know, but we know that all this stuff doesn't work. I've had an instructor tell me way back in the day at a dealer training that the automotive industry is going to experience a big crash pretty soon. And what, what he meant by that is that we're not going to have any more skilled work to work on these cars. And none of these complex modern vehicles are going to be able to get repaired. At 2024, I think we're at that point already. I had a personal customer, his daily driver, Nissan Armada, had a uh, intermittent charging system issue. He brought it to the Nissan dealership and I told him like, dude, don't, don't go to that dealership. Management keeps changing there. I know all the techs there are like basically ex car washers or like ex Jiffy Lube people. Um, dude, you're wasting your time. Don't bring your car there. 
And sure enough, the car spent a week there. The dealership did not even know how to start to diagnose the car. So he ended up just saying, I want my car back. We are at that point. There is no skilled labor out there left at the dealerships to be able to fix your modern complex vehicle. And there is no one coming in to take their place. That should be the teaser intro right there. Thank you guys for watching. Questions, comments, leave it down below. Want to know more about me? Feel free to ask. Uh, CM Auto House here in Fremont, California. We are the premier 8.6 specialist, whether you have a Gen 1, Gen 2, FRS, BRZ, GR86, or if you have the classic AE86, we are NorCal specialist for the 8.6 chassis. Appreciate all the support, you guys, and I will catch you guys next time. Come on, Dexter, come on. Come on, come on, jump, come on. Dexter, come on. Leap, ascend. Come on, Dexter. You're apprehensive, Doug. You're apprehensive. Dexter's on film, look at that. You're on film, Doug. You're on film.